Hello, thanks for joining us again. This is the ninth rebroadcast of a broadcast biography series we began back in the early part of the last decade, 2002 to be exact, after a very, very generous offer and invitation from the good folks at MET Television, that is a school's education channel in Bradenton, Florida, uh, providing us with the services of the recording, the engineering, everything, the technology. Uh, we couldn't have done it. We couldn't have done it as just, you know, private broadcasters club as we are even today. So here we come, and this is the ninth, and this is the only one I've got left. And sorry to spring this on you, but it's my biography, <laughs> my broadcast biography. I wasn't even going to introduce it honestly into the series. And then, before Doug Miles, who was running the camera and looking at us right now, came in, uh, having offered to do these intros again, uh, I was looking at it on my little home playback unit, and uh, I had to I had to sit back and say, "Hey, this kid, yours truly, had some pretty interesting experiences in radio, which I began in late 1955. I retired from the NBC radio network at 30 Rock in 1989, but I'm here to tell you I'm not sitting on the porch counting my money. It wouldn't take that long anyway." But, no, we're still very, very active. This broadcaster's group that we belong to, wonderful friends and people, and the media roundtable, places like that. So, anyway, Irene Herman, one of our broadcast pioneer friends, a fine actress, a singer, all oh, hosts this as she's turned the tables on yours truly to do a look at what I've been able to accomplish, and I'm pretty proud of a lot of it in the broadcast industry. So, if you will, if you would put up with me for almost an hour, here's a look at yours truly and the years down through broadcasting. Welcome to Broadcast Biographies, produced by METV, Manatee Educational Television. These programs are produced under the guidance of the Sarasota County Chapter of Broadcast Pioneers. I'm Irene Herman, and our special guest today is Don Blair, a member of the Broadcast Pioneers chapter and a broadcasting legend. Don, welcome. I didn't know I was a legend, Irene, but uh, if you say so, I'll I take your word for do. it. I definitely do. Okay. Don, let's get back to the very beginning and find out how you got into the broadcast business. Well, the very beginning, I was born in Newark, New Jersey, brought up in New Jersey, Irving, uh, public schools in that state, then drafted in 53, you know, right on the edge of Korea. And during the course of going back and forth from the base to home for weekend passes and so forth, I got hooked on this radio commercial on WNEW in New York for this Cambridge School of Radio and Television Broadcasting, which I think is still there to this day. It was a quick six-month course. I was married midway through my, my term in the Army. No time or money for college. And I, this interested me. I was doing instructing classrooms in, in the Army for a while. And I just felt comfortable in front of a group, so I figured, well, hey, I, I don't know what else we can do. That rolled me into radio. And after a six-month course, I got my first job two Sunday afternoons at WBUD in Trenton, New Jersey. And we have a copy. This is the kind of stuff you gather through life. This is my first W-2 form in radio. How much and money I, did you I make I was paid on? the grand total of $38.75. Oh, so huge. you can see I was overpaid even from the start. <laughs> okay? And then right after that, we want to show you a letter that came from a, a, a gentleman in New Britain, Connecticut. And this is what brought us into Connecticut for the rest of my broadcast career, including the whole New York scene. But they offered me a job for the astounding wage of about 65 bucks a week as a dish jockey, and a rip and read newsman, and that was W-H-A-Y in New Britain. I still have the letter to this day. And we also want to show you real quickly a picture of yours truly as a young disc jockey in the studios of WHAY New Britain, which, by the way, disappeared off the face of the earth a long time ago, like a lot of radio stations. Call letters change, stations go out of whatever. And that was, that was history. That was in the mid to late 50s. By 1959, I, I jumped to the big time in Hartford, Connecticut, WPOP in Hartford. And we've got a shot or two, in particular one with, you remember the singer Anita Bryant? I certainly do. Yeah. Well, well, it was quite a bit of controversy in her time. Oh, a lot of controversy, yeah. She was a beautiful woman, a fine singer, yes, but she also was. she and her husband were extremely bigoted about race, 
about homosexuality. Any subject you named, they had a very strong opinion on, Absolutely. and I think it hurt her career. But nonetheless, I had my picture taken with her at a Columbia Records reception in Hartford in those days. And then also we want to roll in here, Charlie, a picture of... We always were doing things in the community to get the disc jockey team out in front of the public, you know. P.O.P. was a pop for top 40 station, very popular, competing with DRC in Hartford in those days. And any time we could get on like a go-kart track or anything, we would go out and do races. A go-kart track? Don? Little go-karts that little kids ride around in. Well, big kids and ride around in them, too. covered that on radio. Yeah, so we, we throw in a shot here of uh, me and some of my uh, disc jockey buddies in P.O.P., and while I was there, because my boss said, why don't you start a bowling league with the, with the radio and TV stations? It was a brilliant idea because without that, I never would have gotten to know the people that I you know, watched on TV or competed with in radio. Instead, we all end up at a bowling alley one night a week. One night, one of the uh, producers or, or uh, pr program directors from Channel 30 in Hartford walked over to me on the alley and said, Don, how would you like to take a crack at our Saturday night weather? And that put me in the weather set. And, and I've still got a nice 8 by 10 picture of me in the weather set, a very primitive weather set. I mean, compared to the, what you see on television today, this was like, you know, like the 1800s. It was the dark ages, but it was fun. It was black and white TV. That led, they gave me a morning show called... Today in Connecticut, which immediately followed the big Today Show in New York, but, you know, a half hour or an hour, I forget which, locally in Connecticut. And, uh, again, a few more snapshots have made it through my collection all these years, including a couple we can, we can show you with uh, the wonderful and legendary Art Linkletter. That's a big name in You know, kids say right? the darndest yes. things. Well, uh, he was through on a promotional tour. He was on the board of Royal Crown Cola at the time, and... A wonderful, you know, congenial man, the type of person who makes a host job very, very easy. And another picture that we, we have here is uh, one of my favorite people, the late, great governor of Connecticut, Mr. John Dempsey. John Dempsey would meet you during a campaign season when he came in to tape commercials, and two years later he could walk into the studio and still remember your name. What a that's remarkable a ability, yes. Yes, that's, and, and it, it wasn't phony, it was real. He was a, a wonderful, wonderful man. Also, uh, not for, uh, among other reasons, I was going through a divorce at the time and I got hit with alimony and child support and I was looking for extra work. And when a local uh, businessman uh, asked me if I would like to do the announcing at the local stock car track, because I was doing sports on television by then. Uh, I jumped at the chance. Uh, it was big money. Uh, hey, in those days it was big money. And uh, I would do the booth announcing, you know, and they would look like spotters in a football game. They would be constantly telling me who's, who's the lead because in a small track, sometimes with cars passing each other, you don't know who's in first place. But there's people getting paid to do that, and they made me sound good. So, you know, it, it carried me through for a season or two toward the end of my time up in Connecticut. Also, Channel 30 gave me a, a show during the summer because the Kingston Trio and people of that uh, nature were very, very big in those days, and we called it the Summer Hootenanny Roundup. So you were doing everything from sports oh to the cultural things? Just I would do everything. TV in the morning, the Today Show. I would race to New Haven in the afternoon to do a radio show on a daytime radio station, race back to Hartford in the evening to do the sports show at 7.15 and the weather at 11.15 or whatever it was, but again, I have to say, I was writing checks to a former family of mine and my first two children, and I wanted to take care of them. So I was just looking for income everywhere you, you could go. But uh, also, a couple of shots in here that I'm very, very proud of. Uh, used my whatever clout I had at, on TV, and I was on TV is a, an awful lot during the daytime and the evening. And I called some local contractors, and we had some friends, all para boys in wheelchairs for various reasons, polio, uh, swimming accidents, you know, like diving in and, and hitting your head on a rock or a motorcycle accident. And all these guys, we used to do a radio program with them in New Britain and put them on the air in their wheelchairs. And the, t the opportunity came for me to ask local people, road builders and pavers and stuff like that, could you help us build an outdoor athletic platform at the hospital where all these guys live for the rest of their lives. And that's what the pictures are here. We built that platform. And uh, 
these, these people donated, in the, even in those days, thousands of dollars worth of cement and labor and everything else and the basketball backboards and so forth. What so a marvelous project. I was very, very proud of it, very proud of it. I'll tell you what I want to do here now. Uh, this is kind of cute. I was sponsored on the sports show on TV by Narragansett Lager Beer at least one night a week. That was the Red Sox sponsor. We carried Red Sox baseball. Narragansett introduced the ring top can to the beer loving world. And we used to do a live demonstration on the show every night. And that was doing fine. It was working fine. Except my, my director said, the guys on the crew are stealing the beer. So he I goes to the refrigerator to get a six pack to put on TV. Mm -hmm. And there's only two beers left, you know. So he said, tonight, he said, I'm not going to do this anymore. He said, tonight, he says, we're going to roll tape on you. That was the early part of two inch video. They called it quad, I think it was quad the big wide video at black and white and he said if the tape is good then I don't have to worry about replacing the beer anymore so mind you what you're gonna see on this video is when I start saying how ridiculously easy it is to open this can Jerry calls for a tight shot on my hand and my pinky with the ring on my finger and it's supposed to snap off instantly of course the point here <laughs> of the video is it didn't snap off naturally instantly. funny as you know very much <laughs> Here's an important reminder. Narragansett Lager Beer now comes in new ring top cans. This easy to grab ring works so easy, it opens with just your little finger. Narragansett Lager Beer in new ring top cans. Pick up a six pack today. You know, when I first saw that Narragansett commercial, I thought to myself, nobody can open a can of beer with just their little finger. But boy, was I ever wrong. Now, these new Narragansett ring top cans are just about the easiest things to open you ever saw. Now, watch. You just put your little finger in the ring and zip. Off comes the top, just like that. Now, you think I was lucky? Okay. We'll push that one over and we'll try another one. Matter of fact, I'll even leave that ring on there and we'll go again. There we are. Off comes the top. Now, that is what I call easy. And maybe you've already heard that they're replacing the flip top cans. So, hi, neighbor. Have a Gansett in the handy new ring top cans. I took over a sports camera in mid-September of 1964 and since that time I've been asked probably hundreds of times whatever happened to Jack Cumley. Well Jack went to Providence Television and is doing quite a bit of play-by-play -play with colleges in Rhode Island. Well after this weather show coming up at 11:10 tonight should anyone ever ask you whatever happened to Don Blair well you tell them he went to New York to join the mutual radio network as a network radio newscaster and writer. I accepted this position earlier this month and asked permission to finish out the year here at Channel 30. My personal thanks and gratitude for your attention, your compliments, and your criticisms. My successor will be Tommy Monahan in the Bristol area. That family name Monahan and the name Tommy is another word for sports and has been for many years. He knows his subject and believe me, if you're half as kind to him as you have been to me in this past year and a half, he's going to have himself a very pleasant job. One more time for the weather at 11.10 tonight. Thanks for being with us, and good night. Sports Camera with Don Blair has been brought to you by the Veteran Sports Shop, New England Ski Headquarters at 281 Asylum Street, Hartford, and by Super 7 Stores, where you get supermarket values with neighborhood friendliness. I befriended a guy when I was driving to New Haven to do daily radio in the midday, needed the bucks, a man named John Luther who was on his way back from a bout with alcoholism. He practically drummed himself out of the business, a TV station in upstate New York. Even his own family threw him out. And he was trying to get back on, on track. I was able to intercede and get him a very, very low-paying Saturday night local news TV job on my Channel 30. He never forgot that friendship. It cost him more to drive to the station from s w southern Connecticut, Westport, to, to Hartford in a big Packard than he ever made on the station. But that wasn't the point. I had done him a favor. He, I didn't know it at the time, very close friends with the news director of the Mutual Network in New York. I get a phone call one day. Don, get a tape in right away. Chuck King is hiring two new correspondents. And that was my opener to New York. So what goes so around comes around kind watch, of thing. Watch how you treat people on the way Very up because true. you may meet them again on the way down. So what happened with this famous farewell address? Well, there you go. There I, it is. I came on TV and uh, I asked to be able to work out to the end of 1965. 
I actually started the Mutual Network during Christmas week of 65 into 66, and this was my little volunteer, you know, my uh, farewell address on Channel 30. How long did you stay at the Mutual Network on? Uh, a very exciting and event filled, as we're about to find out, seven years, 1965 to 1972. But uh, Thanks to, as I said, to John Luther, and we've got a, a nice picture here. They took a, you know, a good publicity shot of me soon after I got there. Uh, a little more hair in these, in, in the, those pictures that we're showing here on TV right now, but uh, no, it was a complete change of life, and it led very, very quickly into the space business. Well, that of course was a big part of your career. So let's tell about how that got started. Very big. Chuck King, the man who hired me at Mutual, called me in, probably about April of '66 into his office. He said, I'm going to send you on the biggest assignment of your life. And I figured, what the heck could that be? And it was to go out from Boston on the aircraft carrier WASP as one of two correspondents, pool, meaning you report for everybody, pool correspondents for the Gemini 9 mission, which was Tom Stafford and uh, Eugene Cernan. Gene turned out to be the last man to walk on the moon, but nobody knew that then. This was, this was in June of 66. And I have a collector's item tray, a beautiful tray of the USS Wasp, which you're probably looking at right now, which you couldn't buy from me for, well, maybe if you made a real good <laughs> offer. <laughs> but anyway, there's the Wasp, and that started me on a series of, of downrange splashdowns that continued into the early 70s. Uh, next, we're going to go to a slide, I think, here. Uh, the skipper of the Wasp, who still we correspond email and even telephone to this day. Mind you, this is, what, 36 years later? We're still talking. He's retired in, in Oregon. John, and is that you on that that's line? That's me going across from the USS Wasp on what they called the High Line over to the oiler, the Hasayampa, because every couple of days these ships, which are just gobbling up fuel to beat the band, need a new supply. So I went over. I brought back some popcorn and some fresh film and movies, but I got a chance to go over there and have lunch and meet the guys over there. And then what they give you, when we come off of that slide, will show you this certificate, which is called the Order of the Salty Highliners. That's, that's the whole deal of going from one ship to another. You highline from one ship to another. It's done all the time to this day in the Navy. It's two ships, you know, synchronizing their speed and their space, and then you ride across on the rope while the fuel is being pumped Sounds from dangerous. one to the other. And you can also do it on any other ship, and I did it to destroyers and so on. But uh, I just wanted to point out on this certificate, the man who signed the certificate at the bottom, his name was C.E. Nimitz, we Commander, U.S. Name. Navy. It's the, the old man, that's Chester Nimitz, the big boss in the Pacific in World War II. It was his nephew. Oh, my. They keep yeah. it in the family. Yeah, yeah. So I was very struck by that. I had met a Nimitz, and, you know, you're looking at a, at a, at a hero. And you were a member of the Order of the Salty Highliners. That's right. Wow. That's right. Forever and ever. And then I have a, a slide here I want to show you of this is what all ships in the Navy carried in the, in the Gemini days. This is a dummy, an exact boilerplate steel replica in exact size and shape of a Gemini spacecraft. And the only way to learn how to recover these things and pick them out of the ocean is if you've got a dummy spacecraft to rehearse with. So I saw over five missions at sea. I probably saw dozens of these things. Mm -hmm. And th this is on the destroyer Wilson, where we had lunch with Nimitz. And it just shows you how a destroyer would handle it and pick, pick that uh, spacecraft out of the ocean. Whereas on the carriers, you had an inflatable collar rather than that hard collar that you see around it in that slide. But the, the collar would be inflated by the frogmen who would jump into the ocean. And we're going to see some of that, too, as we move along. Another photo I want to show you is the uh, twin-engine, what they call cod flight, a twin-engine plane with the wings that would fold up so it could operate off a carrier. When the Gemini 9 mission was aborted halfway through because of a problem in outer space, they sent many of us back home and said, we'll see you next week. We're going to recycle, turn around, and do the whole thing all over again, which they did, and it was successful. They, they were learning docking in space in those days, and the docking out, out in, in orbit wasn't working very well. So they shipped us back, and they catapulted us off the deck in this plane. And if you ever get a chance to catapult off the deck of a plane, do it. it I think I'll pass. It's very exciting. It beats anything at uh, Disney World or Universal. Now, we uh, got a picture of me with Gemini 9, 
sitting right in front of the spacecraft. This is after the recovery. Cernan and Stafford came through with flying colors, although now that I'm reading books about it, they had a lot of problems out there that uh, they didn't talk about at the time. But this picture shows you very, very vividly what the heat shield, this was all new in those days, this whole terminology of heat shields and super cold fuels, hypergolics, and new words came into our you know, into our vocabulary. It was a real challenge for a broadcaster, oh boy, too. Oh, boy. We did a lot of, you know, a lot of book work and studying, and, and NASA would send you all the technical manuals you could handle. But here's a picture of me in front of the WASP uh, on the WASP hangar bay, on the front of the, the Gemini 9, on the WASP hangar day, bay below the flight deck, which is one deck mm -hmm. below. And the next shot is a nice photo that I took. Most of these are my own, except when I'm in them, of course. Is McDonnell Engineers literally swarming around the deactivated Gemini 9. It's sitting on a dolly so they could roll it right off the ship, which they did. And they're taking all the high, what, the, what I call the high value, high tech equipment, computers, right. very primitive computers at this point, not like they are today. But nonetheless, it was, it was heading down the road toward miniaturization, which the space program actually demanded. Because with all the stuff they had to put into these ships, what we used to know as radio, you know, with tubes and all stuff, would never ever would have flown. Too heavy, too right. much space, so everything had to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and this was the, kind of like the cutting edge of it. Now, the next mission I went on, my, uh, uh, Irene, was Gemini 10. And right after the ship, the uh, Guadalcanal, was notified by the Pentagon, by the Navy Department, you are the recovery ship for Gemini 10 in July, out of Norfolk, which was its home base. Somebody got in a helicopter and took a nice photo of this ship from the air, and a whole bunch of crew members got on the deck and spelled out Gemini 10 oh. in white uniforms. How impressive. Yeah, nice. Yeah. It's black and white, but I think black and white photography at times is very, very exciting. And there's, there's a, a, a nice illustration of it. And then we go back to another slide, and what you'll see here is a little blonde boy in the foreground and in the background, you'll see the crew of Gemini 10. That's, that's uh, Young and Collins, Mike Collins and, and John Young. And they're getting ready to leave and fly back on a helicopter to Bermuda and home. And in the foreground is a little blonde boy. And to the unprepared, people would look at and say, what's a kid doing on a carrier? Well, it was summertime in Norfolk. And the Navy brass said to the officers on the ship, if you've got any youngsters, that aren't doing anything right now and would like to take their summer break with us, sign up. We're allowing, I think, like a dozen kids. And this is one of the very, very fortunate youngsters. She's only about nine or ten years what old. What a marvelous experience. Now, mind for you, these this is people. a middle aged man yeah. today, but what an experience. You know? Must I thought it was very, very nice. Fantastic for them. Yeah. So then we go to uh, Gemini 11. See, I did three in a row in 66. And they used to have meetings of news directors in, in New York at CBS, and they would pick the networks out of a hat. And it was strictly the luck of the draw. And you just got lucky? And strictly lucky that my network was picked for Gemini 9, 10, and 11. And because I was the designated downrange guy by this time in my career, uh, I just automatically went back on another carrier. And Gemini 10 and 11 were both out of Norfolk, Virginia. And I have a photo here on the USS Guam. These are helicopter ships only. They don't take planes down the deck and off the front like most, most uh, carriers, like the Wasp, and coming up soon, the Hornet. No, these were strictly for helicopter landing and takeoff and for bringing Marines on land in, in you know, uh, invasion type situations, but in this case, of course, find the astronauts of Gemini 11. Terry Drinkwater and I did the co-pool on this, and there's a picture here of me and Terry doing a little public relation type photography on the deck with a NASA photographer who was kind enough to follow us around with his camera. And this time the astronauts were the late Pete Conrad and Richard Gordon. That was Gemini 11. Now, let me take you to the big one. For some reason, we didn't get the pick of the draw at the pool meetings in CB at CBS in New York until 1969. That's fast forward three years. Mm -hmm. I always said to people, I don't care if I ever do another mission as long as I get Apollo 11. Everybody that was doing this type of work wanted that one. Not to worry. It was so huge, so big in our history and in interest, so big 
that they sent four correspondents, one from radio, that was me, and one from CBS, ABC, and NBC. I roomed with Ron Nesson of NBC. We have a picture of him. We can tuck Chuck in here somewhere, standing with a clipboard. That was Ronnie, who later went on to become Gerald Ford's press secretary. Yes, you do. Remember? Yes, I do. Yeah, not, not too many years after we, we shipped out mm -hmm. together. And uh, so they put us on the Hornet, and we've got, again, a slide that I took from 8,000 feet in a helicopter of the wonderful USS Hornet the prime recovery ship for the first mission to the moon. And this gives you a vivid picture of what they did to all our Essex-class carriers after World War II. They put them in dry dock, and they ripped them up, and they built what they call the canted deck off to one side. What that did was that meant they could launch a plane off the front at almost the same time as they're landing a plane on the back, because the plane landing goes off to the left on this canted deck and not goes crashing into the plane in front. But uh, it, it did make a lot, you know, things a lot faster for operations after that. And that's, that's a picture of uh, the USS Hornet, which is now a museum ship out in Alameda, California, I'm happy to say. And then the next slide up was, is that one of Ronnie Nesson? And, uh, and then a black and white photo he, we've got here of, um, that one of the NASA photographers took of us, of me posing. I wasn't broadcasting at that moment. It was a it. nice publicity shot of me above the Hornet's flight deck. You can see the aircraft down below on the Hornet. Now, of course, with the Hornet, we're back to an Essex-class carrier, and it can take both helicopters and fixed wing. And in the re actual recoveries and in the rehearsals, both aircraft were used extensively. You know, you had a, a fixed wing was called the Air Boss at, at about 15,000 feet, and then the helicopters, which carried all the frog teams, which did the actual recoveries, were at 8,000 feet and, and flying around so they could get in there real, real close. Now, I want to take you, not in exact sequence, but these are color enlargements that were made by uh, Kodak and Canon camera, because they first loaned me some very, very nice camera equipment to take pictures on this mission, and when they saw how the pictures turned out, they said keep the cameras, which was a very nice little, little benefit. That's a but good the, perk. The first picture you're going to see in this large, these, these color enlargements, by the way, were made up in sets of seven with my name on them and sent to camera stores all over the United States. Wow. I have no idea how many sets are still out there, but I hope whoever has them had the good sense to hold on to them because they're irreplaceable. Definitely a collector's they're, yeah, item. they're priceless, yeah. And uh, gosh, it couldn't have been more than a few hundred sets, but I've got one of them, real beat up. This picture... Oftentimes, I was given the opportunity to go out on these simulated recoveries in the helicopters, and I went out every time I was asked, do you want to go? Take my cameras, hang out in the doorway, strapped in so you don't head into the ocean, and take photography. And that's why I've got slides that I use to this day in lectures all around the, the country and in cruise ships and so on. But this is the crew during a rehearsal, and I caught the big swimmer, the chief of the frog team, in midair leaping out the helicopter door into the ocean. His crew is already in the ocean, having dropped a bag in the ocean that contained the, the flotation collar. They rip the bag open, just pull a little string, which turns on the CO2 container, and that, boom, blows up the collar like a balloon. And it's perfectly round because the Apollo was perfectly round. And it goes around the, collar, the, uh, the, the spacecraft, and that's what stabilizes it in both rehearsals and in the real thing. Now on the second shot, a very, very intense up-close shot, I'm on the deck of the Hornet using a 500 millimeter lens. And these guys are way out in the Pacific and this picture is like right in your lap. The clarity is outstanding. And it's a nice tight shot of the dummy spacecraft and the UDT, I call them UDT guys, that means underwater demolition team. These are frogmen, almost Navy SEALs, highly trained, but you doing an absolute joyride in doing spacecraft recoveries because it's not dangerous, at least shouldn't be, and it's not death dealing, it's not like fighting the enemy, it's fun, it's good news. And they reveled in it, and they, they really, really loved it. Now, the other picture uh, we want to mig migrate I to. I really want to hear about this one. During the re rehearsals, we did two or three in a week's time, every time we went on one of these missions. And they would send the helicopters out to find the spacecraft, which, which had a little radio beacon on it so they could home in on it. And it worked very, very well. But during that time, we crossed the equator. 
the international dateline, I guess. And that has very special meaning. Yes, in the Navy, and uh, not on cruise ships, but in the Navy, as we were talking earlier in the, in the car on the way up here, it's a guy thing. It's barbaric. It's, it can be dangerous. Uh, I know a lot of, I saw a couple of guys near me on their knees on the deck actually saying their Hail Mary. They were praying to get through it. Because we spent four to five hours on our knees on the f bare metal and we went up steps, almost vertical ladders in these hatchways, which only had little rubber strips on them to protect your knees. But I mean, it was painful. And this is done just because of tradition? Yeah. You Some cross kind the of equator macho and tradition. You, you are then, you start out as a slimy polywog. And after four hours of torture and, uh, and going through kitchen swill and garbage and getting half your hair cut off and getting whipped on the butt, one of the slides I've got here shows yours truly looking up from a crowd of people, human beings, that looks like cattle. And that's the way we were treated, like cattle. Sounds and like great look, fun, Don. If you looked up, you got, you got your butt whipped Ooh. real bad. And it took a, a month or two for the scars to disappear from my rear end. But you graduated from being a slimy polywog? I got polywog. a certificate. Okay. I got a certificate, Irene, which, well, we'll, show, it's all worth which it. we'll show here. I had become a shellback. And there's a, I won't go into it now, but there's a saying when you meet a Navy guy and he says, are you a shellback? And you say, yeah, bet you're bippy I am. And That's you buy each other honor. drinks. It's a okay. big guy thing, big guy thing. <laughs> Obviously. Let's go back. Now we're down to the real thing. Once the astronauts were safely in the trailer where they spent three weeks in quarantine, I, I was off the air. I had done over four hours by myself of radio to the world. My producer said, maybe the largest radio audience of all time, because anywhere else on Earth you, that you heard yeah. this, I was the only one. Now I'm a, civi I'm a civilian again. I'm a tourist. I'm off the air. My TV friends are still doing the acquisition of the spacecraft and all that stuff for TV. I just went alongside the ship with Life magazine and Look magazine and, and National Geographic and all the rest and stood there and started banging out pictures. And I got this picture of the real Apollo 11. And uh, that's, that's very, very similar to the one that appeared only a week later in Look Magazine. It was so similar, I was, I was afraid they might f see mine and say I stole it. But we were, we were shoulder to shoulder, you know, bing, 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 so taking pictures at the same instant. you get the same, the same photograph. Yeah, yeah. Now, just about that time, you had the arrival of the President of the United States oh, yes. aboard that beautiful marine helicopter, you know, that, that olive colored helicopter that they still use to this day. And here is Mr. Nixon appearing at the doorway of the helicopter about to come down. And then the next slide is as Nixon and Tom Paine, the head of NASA and others, the Captain Carl Cyberlick, the skipper of the, of the Hornet, and others moved along the deck. And there's a small man slightly bent over right next to, uh, to in back of, of Nixon. And he's got his arm out like he's shaking hands with somebody. That is Admiral John McCain, Sink Pack, Commander in Chief, Forces in the Pacific at that time. And this is the father. This is the father of Senator John I McCain. See. Okay, we had coffee in McCain's cabin. I always remember him because he was a little man and he smoked cigars that were almost as tall as he was. But he's a very, very delightful human being. So then we go to after uh, that shot my large color photo, which is actually uh, Nixon is gone, and this is the crew of the Apollo 11 talking to all of us, thanking the Navy for doing such a wonderful job. We never got to do Q&A with them. They could talk to us, but we couldn't stand there and ask them questions. NASA just wouldn't allow it. But here's the crew in the window. It's, uh, you know, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins. And in the back, you can see one of the two NASA technicians who also spent the three weeks with them there in the trailer. And over the window in this picture, you will see a sign that says Hornet plus three. That very simply meant we better come back to Pearl Harbor with three more than we left Pearl Harbor with. Pretty simple slogan. Right. And, and very we meaningful. Did. We did. Three live people. And then I have a shot here of me in front of the Apollo 11, taken by one of our friends, just to prove I was there. And it gives you a nice, vivid picture of the deactivation of the spacecraft as they're going back and forth to take moon rocks out of it. And Irene, you see this translucent plastic tunnel that connects the trailer where they had to live for three weeks with the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. That was to protect them and us from possible moon germs. 
whatever contamination they might yeah, have. Yeah, there could have been something on the moon we didn't know anything about. Right. Turned no out had been it, there before. Turned about it, no problem, no problem. And the next shot we can go to is a totally deactivated Apollo 11, ready to go home to the Smithsonian. The translucent tunnel has been taken down. The astronauts are in the trailer to stay for the next almost three weeks in Houston. The trailer was put physically onto uh, a C-5A transport and offloaded at, at Pier Bravo in Pearl Harbor, which is our last photo in this particular color series. Everybody's inside, and at this point, when that picture was taken, I was on the air broadcasting the offload at Pier Bravo. And the governor of Alaska was down there, and in a way, and you know, all those people and so forth. Now I want to show you a black and white photo which I was showing the crew here in our studios, uh, maybe the best picture I've ever taken in my life, certainly the most significant. That night, when the whole ship was hunkered down, we had three men back from the moon safely in their trailer, cleaned up, shaved, had, you know, good dinners as opposed to stuff out of a tube in space and so on. I went back down to the flight deck late that night, said, I wonder what's going on down there. And the trailer was all by itself, nobody around but a marine guard standing just to the left of the window at the very front end of the trailer. And standing in the front room was the first man to walk on the moon, Neil Armstrong. And he's got a ukulele in his hand. And I had black and white film. I had a big lens on the camera. I was able to push it up to obliterate the, the window. You don't know I'm taking a picture through a window. You wouldn't if I didn't No, it's say not yeah. obvious. But because I had no flash attachment and was using fast black and white, the lighting in the, in the trailer diffused. I always thought halo-like, which I thought was appropriate. It for does a, have that look. For a on. man who's come as close to heaven, I think, as any of us are likely to what get. What a great candid shot of Neil yeah. Armstrong. I walked away after snapping off three quick frames, turned and looked around, and he had gone. So the opportunity had disappeared. And but I was the only person there. And you seized that moment. This and is and a one-of-a-kind shot. I'm very, very proud of it. With good reason. Next, you can a couple of more things that uh, I'll pass along to the grandchildren. A couple of first aid covers, envelopes, any major event that is where the post office stamps it the day oh, of yes. the event. Okay. Well, this was postmarked and canceled right on the aircraft carrier in the post office on the ship. One was addressed to my, my, my parents and the other addressed to my wife and I back in Connecticut. But oh. you notice the postage on these 10 cents? Oh my goodness. <laughs> that, <laughs> that does does that tell you it was a <laughs> it little while back? Yeah. We've had a little bit of inflation yeah, since then. Yeah. And we could probably show you uh, the wonderful Apollo uh, mug, a, a beautiful stein that uh, we were able to buy. They asked us to put our autograph on, an, on, a, on the uh, application, and that autograph was perfectly reproduced in gold leaf on the, on the mugs when we finally got them in the mail, you know, a month or two later. Just one of those close-ups. And also a hardcover book that the Hornet published on the whole mission with beautiful pictures in it. And that was sent to us through the mail. And then also what I'd like to show you is some space hardware. We can do a tight shot on that on a board that I put together that I use on lectures. And there's a piece from uh, uh, just a little washer from the, from the outside skin of one of the Geminis, and then a bolt, a titanium bolt from one of the Geminis, a little ceramic bolt from Apollo 11. I actually have a piece of the spacecraft that went to the moon and back. Mm -hmm. And then the last little piece on the board is a piece of gold leaf that peeled off the outside of Apollo 15. Mm -hmm. It's just the idea of having part of it, okay? Just a piece of it. Apollo 15 was my last assignment in the summer of 1971. And that was David Scott, Jim Irwin, and Alan Warden. And this first slide is again another piece of broadcasting and space history. We're again standing alongside the deck looking out in the Pacific as the Apollo 15 is, is floating into view. I mean, it's on a cable. We're, we're, we're pulling it in. And there's a little dory in it with, with guys from the ship, ship's crew, and beyond the dory, you can see this blur in the water. And we're all hollering. I don't know if I was the first, but I was one of the first to say to the kids, hey, get that, get that. What is it? Get it. Well, they scrambled over, and they got it just in the nick of time because in another 30 seconds, it would have just found its way to the bottom of the Pacific, maybe two or three miles down. And what was this? The next slide shows what it really was when we got it on board. It was the nose cone of Apollo 15 which was blown off 
by explosive devices by the astronauts crew at 10,000 feet. Now, every other time in space history, when that thing gets blown off, it sails across the sky like a Frisbee, because that's what it looks like. And you never it see does, it again. Yes. You never see it again. This was blown off, and Jim Irwin made a comment on the, on the descent down, I think we've hit something. And indeed, what probably happened was that nose cone clipped one of the three parachutes and caused one of the three parachutes to only partially inflate. So instead of landing at a certain miles per hour, it landed about four miles an hour faster. But because it hit the canopy, it stopped its, its ride, and instead it fell like a rock. And that's why, for the first and only time in space history, a nose cone was recovered. That is remarkable. And that's in the Smithsonian. It is in the Smithsonian, I so we can actually I, see it. Well, thanks thanks to you and a few other if people. If it isn't in the Smithsonian, it, it should, it be, should there be Because that's a piece of history. Irene, you got a letter there. I do, Don. I would be honored if you would read, after my coverage of Apollo 15, a broadcast colleague back in New York wrote this letter. This is quite a tribute, and I think it's appropriate. It's from Don Dusnap. Dusnap, yeah. And he says, I wish to take this opportunity to make a few comments on a fine radio coverage of the Apollo 15 recovery from the USS Okinawa. In my opinion, Don Blair's work was extremely professional. I had the unique position of being in downrange audio control, where I could hear the radio commentary, the TV commentary, and all of the producers simultaneously. Don's commentary was far ahead of any other coverage. Even though a TV picture was on the screen showing the capsule coming in with a problem, no comments were heard on TV until a minute after Don Blair had told us what was really happening. As a matter of fact, Don's commentary throughout was one to two minutes ahead of TV. The overall producer in Houston caught on quickly and began to take his cues from Blair in order to advise the networks on the executive coordinating circuit. Obviously, Blair had done much homework, and his liaison with the Navy and NASA was close and accurate. All in all, a very commendable performance. Congratulations, Don. That's a, a well-deserved And that treatment. letter went to my immediate boss and bosses at the Mutual Network in New York. Didn't hurt any. I didn't get a nickel increase in pay or anything. They didn't raise your salary? They didn't raise my pay. Make you the <laughs> president of the network or anything like that? No, no, no. But it's a nice commentary from one of your peers yes, knowing that you did a good job. Yes, and that's the kind of letter, at least in my, in my uh, feelings, that's the kind of letter you don't, you don't let get away. Oh, of course no, not. That was very, very nice. Oh, I'm delighted to have had the chance to bring it to everybody's yes, attention. Yes, thank you. Thank you very, very much. So, uh, while we're at, uh, still at Mutual, back on land in 1970, I had the unique opportunity to go on a, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the word, subsidized tour to the Middle East, my only trip to Israel, and I'm so glad I went in 1970. That is an experience. Oh, boy, because with what's going on there now, it's so sad. And uh, I really, uh, I, always, I always was a fan of the Israelis, and I it really started there, and it's hung with me ever since. But we've got a few pictures to go through that we can show you now. Uh, first, first one is a group of us on the incredible Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem. No matter what your religion or th feelings are, it, it's, it's impossible to go there without feeling. Then a picture of me at, and a bunch of us at Hadassah Hospital. I have the 8-millimeter camera in my face. And Ed, Reg Murphy is standing to my right. He was then the editor of the Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Constitution, famous newspaper. Mm -hmm. A couple of years later, he was kidnapped and, and kept in the trunk of a car for a couple of days, but got out safely. And then in the last of these three shots taken in, in, in uh, Israel, in Jerusalem, there's a group of us, including myself, in a little chit-chat with the, the, the great mayor of Jerusalem for, I don't know, decades, Teddy Kolick, the mayor of Jerusalem. And uh, he was the one that uh, let us sit in his office for over an hour, and we just had the tape machines running. And uh, we might even be able to throw up a copy of the newspaper. I wrote a huge article for the Bridgeport, Connecticut Sunday Post shortly after that. And they put you know, our picture in it and a picture of us sitting with Teddy and so forth. So anyway, shortly after that, the Mutual Network decided to uh, kind of hunker down, reduce costs, and move to the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and that's when I left the Mutual Network. How long had you been with them? Seven years. Seven years. Got a very, very lovely letter from my boss saying how much he regretted it but understood it. I'd spent my whole life in the New England area, and I wasn't about, at that point, to uproot and try to find a home. And, you know, I walked across the street 
and went to work for WCBS News Radio 88. Bingo. Walked in the door. I had a seven-year reputation. I didn't have to do an audition tape. And I was hired instantly and spent a very exciting two years there. I covered some monstrous stories. And then from there, after two years of tearing my hair out, because news, news, all news radio, if anybody watching is in it or knows anybody in it, it is a zoo. It is, it is a challenge. Because There's a lot it, of airspace to fill. It eats up a lot of material. It definitely does. And, and you're there doing the writing, most of it, or they're throwing it at you while you're on the air, on the run, and it's a good, tra it's a great ground. And then I went back to the ABC radio network for less than a year because I was starving to get back to good old five-minute newscasts, which you can, you know, the total content on the air is only a couple of minutes anyway with commercial time. So I went back to ABC less than a year. That was stormy. I won't get totally into that, but it was a stormy time. And the opportunity came to jump to 30 Rockefeller Plaza, Fif the last 15 years in New York with the NBC radio network. And that was heaven on earth. And we ended up there. I came in the week that Nixon was crashing. And so right in the middle of one of the biggest stories ever. Instead of doing just hourlies, five-minute hourlies, we were doing around-the-clock specials with five-minute breaks and throwing in features on this new man, Gerald Ford, and what was he like and so forth. Every man and woman that was employed by the NBC radio network was detailed, get this, get that, get on the phone, do this, cover this, boom, 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 boom. Exciting. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's adrenaline pumping time, and that's the way I started out at the NBC network. And from then on, with a, only under contract for two years, I was on a handshake freelance contract until the very, very end of it. But uh, while I got into the NBC world as a freelancer, I had no contractual restrictions on me. So that's when I started my freelance career. And you did some exciting and interesting hundreds things. Hundreds of, of industrial videos. I mean, literally hundreds over the next 15, 20 years. In fact, I'm just still doing them for, on occasion down here. But I brought along some video. <laughs> <laughs> okay, these, these we really have to hear about. <laughs> yeah, well, roll them, roll the tape, and we'll take a look at a few minutes of the kind of stuff I was doing for major corporations in the Connecticut and Westchester County area. We'll go into that. Finally, developing the future today has meaning for you, the Astra A team member. Your professional development is a key to both your future and that of Astra. You are a very important part of the team. Each of you are professionals, and as professionals, you must constantly keep working on your skills to become even better. So the training you receive today, the learning that takes place today, will directly affect your professional performance in the future. Your goals, your aspirations, are all tied to what steps you take now. We really are developing the future today. During the debate, lawyers were chastised by one of the gentlemen as members of a secret society. In truth, most lawyers of the time enjoyed a fair amount of respect from their communities. In fact, lawyers were often the very experts brought in to wrestle with the meaning and intentions of our Constitution. Take the case of a country lawyer right here in the village. One of his cases requiring constitutional interpretation dealt with pigs, preachers, and politics. The real issue was separation of church and state. As the easy open can extends to every product in the supermarket, our long dependency on the can opener could come to an end. Happy 30th anniversary, Barrington. The future is here in this tiny silicon chip. And it's having a mighty big effect on the way we communicate with each other. And perhaps you can appreciate that effect more when you realize that this is all of this. Because ConSave's program is of vital importance to Connecticut renters and homeowners, Connecticut Public Television has taped portions of a typical audit so that viewers can see how it's conducted. Of course, details vary from house to house, depending on construction and energy usage. Now, the house to be audited is in Westport and belongs to Denise and Jerry Davidoff. The auditor is Jeffrey Granger, area supervisor for Volt Technical Corporation. Volt is under contract to supply trained audit personnel for the CONSAVE program. Because no information has value unless you have access to it, no machine has value until it can make information available. Access makes you more productive. Availability, the time a machine is up and running, 
makes it more productive. So far, we have seen what non-qualified deferred compensation plans can do for an employer and what life insurance can do for the plans. Let's take a look at how these plans work. Several hundred high technology companies crowd the suburban area around Ottawa. Here in Silicon Valley North, a specialty is telecommunications equipment. Gear that lets computers talk to one another over telephone lines. Welcome. You're about to be introduced to a very important and exciting segment of the alcoholic beverage industry, on-premise selling. It's important because of the volume, prestige, and brand exposure that our products not only receive, but also add to the on-premise market. It's exciting because of the creativity involved in dealing successfully with the on-premise accounts. NBC gave me a uh, nice little extra couple of hundred bucks a week, I guess, to do a daily five-minute economic report called, we, the, we gave it the name, Inflation Watch. Oh. And NBC was nice enough. Now, mind you, I'm only a freelancer. I'm not under contract. I'm just there working a couple days a week, filling in vacations and sicknesses and illnesses, and, and I had a regular weekend gig and so forth. They gave me a full page in U.S. News and World Report, full black and white ad. Jerry Ford was on the cover, I remember. I still have the magazine, naturally. One of my producer friends came out of the studio where I did my Inflation Watch radio scripts every week, and he said, Blair, he says, if you're not doing anything, I need a narrator. We're doing a tribute to Irving Berlin. Was he Irving had, Berlin there? No, no. He lived on Park Avenue. He was very reclusive. He was, he was approaching was 91 years old, and he didn't give interviews anymore. Never gave many anyway. That's true. But he wasn't talking to anybody. His family wouldn't let you get near him. So we decided, rather than wait to do a post, you know, a posthumous tribute, let's do it while he's alive. He actually lived another 10 years after that. But I sat with a cup of coffee, studied the script, and I said to Herb Gordon, all right, let's roll the tape. And I did this one hour or better special tribute loaded with great music, you know, Crosby and Ella Fitzgerald and Dinah Shore and Como and all the rest, who didn't sing a, you know, an Irving Berlin song. Everyone. And, and then uh, uh, one of the uh, program directors down in Virginia sent me the ad that they put in the paper down there for that show with a little note down the bottom, another very nice note saying how well received the program had been and so forth. So it was a great deal of fun. Now, right next to Apollo 11 and covering that and being the only radio voice to the world, nothing ranks higher in my imagination and my, you know, memory than what Fred Kennedy did one Sunday in, in early January when the hostages had been held hostage for over 440 days. And we knew something was going to happen, but not exactly when and where. Fred Kennedy was our London bureau chief for NBC, came on to the speakers in the studios in Manhattan, screaming, New York, New York, this is Kennedy, this is Kennedy, put me on, put me on, it's over, it's over. I stood up ready to race into the studio and do a talk up for a bulletin, a, a crash through, you know, right. any time type broadcast. The kid behind the desk stood up and said, Mr. Blair, you can't do that. I said, why not? He said, Fred is the only source for this story. I said, you're forgetting something. You're listening up there on that speaker to the best bureau chief in the business. And if he says it's over, it's over. I'm going in. I'm going to put him on the air. If he's wrong, he's out of work and Blair's out of work. Well, I put them on. This is the cassette you're about to hear. The bulletin that broke the hostage story <laughs> hours ahead of everybody in the business. What a scoop. Yeah, yeah. I was only the anchor, but I did break the rules. And if I hadn't broken the rules, that, that bulletin might not have gotten on for hours. Well, the rule is that you should have a, a, second, a, a second source. A second source, yeah, yeah. But uh, I had a habit of breaking rules once in a while in those days. But well, obviously it worked for you, Don. Yeah, in this case it did. Yeah, yeah. This is an NBC News hotline report. This is Don Blair, NBC News. We take you now to NBC's Fred Kennedy in London. This is an exclusive. It's an answer to all our prayers. The prayers of the nation have been answered. The captivity of the 52 American hostages is ending. And freedom, freedom is absolutely just around the corner. We have been told in an exclusive interview with Pars News Agency, the official Iranian news agency, who have just spoken with the Prime Minister's advisor and the head of Iran's hostage. 
hostage negotiation team, Mr. Nobuzi. He said the final reply from the U.S. government has been received a few minutes ago, and they have reached an agreement. Nobuzi says there are some small disagreements, but they are not important. They are not important at all. He says that an agreement has been reached. Okay, Fred, Don Blair in New York, uh, where do we go from here? Who do we hear from next before we can nail this well, thing to the wall? It's simple, freedom. From here, if we were going to look at the logistics, the scenario, this is going to be announced throughout the world very shortly. Uh, officially, by the other networks and the other wire services, they will pick it up soon. Uh, from that point, the, uh, the hostages will be checked by the six Algerian doctors, which are in Tehran. From there, they will be moved to Tehran Airport and put on a Algerian aircraft, chartered aircraft, which is arriving in Tehran tonight, and then be flown to Algiers. From that point, we understand they will be turned over to the Americans and the tricky financial and legal complications which have gone on over the last week in Algiers will be finally completed and uh, Iran will get its assets, they'll be unfrozen, and America will get its 52 hostages back. Okay, Fred. Just but anyway, and, 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 and then on to uh, during those days when I, I was freelance and could move around, uh, they had a World's Fair in Tennessee, which I got myself down to. And, and that, was, that was a ball because I got to ride in and pilot the Goodyear blimp. Now, that must have been an experience. Yeah, they, they had a, a note in the newsroom at the, at, at the press center at, at, in Knoxville. Any members of the media wanting to go up in the blimp, which was an anchored, tethered out at the airport that we flew into, and sign up, and, and, and they take up two or three of us each morning. And I, my, term, my time came, my, my, my chance, and we floated up over the Tennessee River at about 20, 25 miles an hour with the windows open. We were actually hollering down to fishermen in the river, and they could hear us, and we could hear them. Oh, they must have been happy to see you floating yeah. up there above them. Yeah, yeah. And you said you piloted this thing, though? Yeah, at one point, the kid that was, was, was piloting for Goodyear got out of the chair, and he says, uh, I need somebody to, to run this thing. And we all got a chance to sit behind the wheel. And it's like a bicycle wheel alongside you to your right, and you go forward or backward in the nose of the, of the dirigible. You, you know, could the make it go like a roller up coaster? And down. Yeah, we tipped it a little bit, a little bit. One little fact about, about the, uh, the blimp. When it's retired from service due to too much sun and rain and wind and weather and wear and everything else. They take the gondola off and the, and the tail situation and the engines, of course. There's two engines, one on each side, pushing back, uh, push props. They take all the hardware off, and when they collapse the bag and they fold it up, that whole blimp, the bag, fits into a box the size of a Coke machine. I That's found incredible. that kind of cute, wow. kind of cute. Uh, 1986. The Challenger disaster. Oh, one of the most terrible moments in broadcast history. Yeah, of oh any yeah, history. very, very definitely. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and of course, until the World Trade Center came along, and uh, kind of erased all our memories of, of what we thought was horror. But that was it for that moment. I had been covering the Super Bowl for NBC Radio for uh, oh quite a few days. I was taping all the parties and the music and everything else for the radio net, and my plane was was just. Coincidentally, I rooted from New Orleans home to Houston and then up to Newark. And I was already on a flight to Houston when the Challenger blew up. When I hit the ground, I called New York. I said, what do you want me to do? They said, stay there, get a motel, get a, well, I had a car, and cover it every day until we tell you to come home. And I, they told me not to come home until after Reagan flew in and, to the memorial service. That's one of those difficult assignments. Awful, awful assignment. Uh, I was on the air live on, on, on uh, the full radio network with Steve Porter of NBC, still a good friend, an excellent broadcaster. And when the planes flew over, jets flew over the, the space center, one of the pilots kicked his afterburners and, and, and jumped out of the formation, missing man. Yes. I looked up and <gasps> I went like that, and I lost it. I just choked up. I couldn't say another word. Well, honest emotion. Totally lost it on the air. And because I was standing there with another professional, Mr. Porter jumped right in. And after we got off the air and were packing to come home, after 10 long days on the road, the Super Bowl, the fun to the Super Bowl, to the horror of Challenger, I called New York and I said to my producer, Joni Jefferson, I said, Joni, what do you think of your brave anchor down here? losing it on the air when the jets went over. He, she laughed and she said, Don, she says, when you lost it, you took about 100 people in this newsroom with you. 
Well, honest emotion always carries other yeah, people. Yeah, they heard me, that. and then, oh, they all went. They all went. So uh, I had to leave NBC in 1989 in February because just like Mutual went to Washington to, to save a buck, NBC had been sold by General Electric to Westwood One. And Westwood took us to the, the suburbs of, of Washington, D.C., or took the network anyway, cheapened it, just destroyed a, a, a once great product, and I didn't want any part of it, nor did any of my colleagues in New York. So uh, we just walked away in, in, in the early 80s. My last newscast was February 4th of 1989. And then I just figured, if I can't live on the freelance business and clientele that I've created, then uh, that's too bad. I'll just, just have to do something else. Well, Don, you've had an exciting career. What are you doing these days? Well, I'm doing lectures on the space program, on cruise ships, and at Disney World at one particular hotel, trying to write for the local paper, uh, trying to get a book written based on my space experience, and doing broadcast biographies for educational TV here in, in the county, things like that. Well, Don, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for being here on Broadcast Biographies, and this is Irene Herman for Broadcast Pioneers.